Okay, I hope uh, everyone can hear me. Please uh, type into chat if you can hear me. Uh, Sedan says good morning. Okay, I, I guess you can hear me. Great. Okay, um, let's get started. Uh, as always, just a few uh, housekeeping notes before we dive back uh, into lecture. Um, we are going to finish up uh, slide deck number uh, three today on packed analysis, people performing activities uh, in a context using technology. And then we'll dive into our sec second theme uh, of the course on uh, design. Just a reminder, if you haven't already, make sure to uh, click over to the attendance sheet and indicate that, uh, that you're here. Okay. Um, any quick questions about uh, the second deliverable? If there are longer questions, uh, Amanda and I are happy to field those questions in office hours. Any questions? No, so far so good. Okay, um, just a, a housekeeping, another housekeeping note. Um, uh, my office hours are usually today, Thursdays, uh, 11 to noon, but I've had to move my office hours uh, from three to four. Uh, you can see that note in uh, Microsoft Teams. As always, just click over to the remote office hours spreadsheet, which you can find from the syllabus, um, and sign up your name there if you want to meet with me, or click on uh, Amanda, the TAs, office hour spreadsheet to sign up for office hours uh, with her. Okay, all good? Okay, so back to uh, our discussion of uh, packed analysis. Um, as always in HCI, we are trying to resist for as long as possible thinking about uh, technological impl implementations until we have thought very carefully about who is potentially going to be supported by that technology. What kinds of activities are those people uh, desiring to carry out? Uh, and finally, what is the explicit uh, and maybe obvious and not so obvious aspects of the context, context in which those activities are going to be carried out? that is together going to inform our decisions about how to go about designing an interactive technology uh, for, that, for that task. Uh, so we ended last time by starting to unpack people. What do we mean by putting people first? Um, and then we will move on in a moment to unpacking activities. What are the various aspects of an activity that we need to think about when creating an interactive technology to support it? And then finally, we'll move on uh, to context. So uh, obviously people differ. So most of what we're doing when we're thinking about putting people first is focusing on people, plural, not person or demographic. What is the breadth of physical, psychological, cognitive, cultural uh, diversity that we wanna try and support with the technology? That's a big ask, so we may not be trying to support all possible diversity, but at least we want to make it clear um, to whom, who, who is it that is actually going to be supported by this uh, technology. So um, we talked last time about physical differences, uh, differences in visual or sensory acuity. Some people can see and hear better uh, than others. We talked about uh, motor control. Some people are able to control their limbs and find motor control better uh, than others. Um, the ability to control our muscles obviously changes over our life course. Not so good at the beginning of our lives or towards the end of our lives. Um, and finally, obviously, people differ in terms of body shape, size, and, and color, which again sees, seems obvious. But some aspects of these physical differences are not so obvious. Uh, it, the relevance of these features are not so obvious for the design of technology. Let's look at an example. Um, you're, you're starting to do a fair bit of work with leap motion. What aspects of body shape, size, and color may impact somebody's ability to work well with leap motion? Any ideas? So let's think about this uh, moving into the future. Uh, in the next few weeks, um, you're going to be, uh, we're going to be collecting uh, data from, each person is going to be collecting data from the Leap Motion device. 
and myself and the TA are going to be collecting all of those data sets from all of you, bundling them into one large data set. And then in the following, uh, in about two or three weeks, you're going to then be downloading that combined data set that contains data that's been generated by everyone in the class. We've got 64 people in the class at the moment. We're going to have 64 data sets in that combined data set, which is data that's drawn directly uh, from all of your hands. And you're going to be applying a machine learning algorithm to try and recognize, to use that data to recognize where in that data set someone is signing uh, one of the 10 ASL digits. What is it about that data set that may impact your machine learning, uh, your machine learner's ability to predict whether or not you are signing one of the ASL digits? If we're going to train that machine learning algorithm on these 64 data sets. So uh, Sananth says size, right? So we're going to have obviously uh, different sized hands in that data set. And if your hand is about the average size of everybody's hand in the class, your machine learner is going to probably do a pretty good job of recognizing your hand. Who might be unintentionally excluded based on their physical difference? So children, absolutely. So uh, we're gonna. Most of you uh, are have more or less adult-sized hands. So if you test this with uh, a little brother or sister, um, we may have a problem. Who else among the 64 of us is gonna have a hard time getting their machine learner to recognize their ASL signs if that learner is trained on the other 63 students? Think carefully about the context of this class. So on average, females have smaller hands. So that's a physical difference, but that's linked to some other uh, aspect of context about this class. Left-handed people are also uh, in the minority. Exactly. So if there's any lefties here, um, you're going to have a harder time than the right-handed majority. We'll take that into account. Let's go back to the gender difference of size hands. How is that? Why is that going to matter in this particular class? What is the what is the context that is linked to the gender differences in hand size? This class in computer science, as Robert mentioned, is mostly male, right? So we are going to have a distribution of hand sizes, but that distribution is influenced by some perhaps less obvious aspects of the physical and cultural context around this class. Right? Again, as always in HCI, some of these aspects may be more or less obvious. People are going to have different sized hands. We're going to have a minority of lefties. We're also going to have a minority of a smaller sized uh, set of hands. Okay. Uh, obviously, people differ uh, uh, psychologically as well. We have different cognitive biases. Some people tend to think spatially. Some people like things to unfold uh, over time. An important aspect of cognitive differences is cultural differences, and in spe specifically language uh, differences. Uh, English has done a pretty good job of pervading most parts of the world and the internet as a whole, but there are still lingering aspects of language uh, diversity that influence how people interpret a novel technology when they first encounter it. So uh, let's have a look at four very familiar icons to anyone who does anything on the web. We have two leftward pointing uh, triangles and two rightward pointing triangles. Um, most of us obviously know that arrows that point to the right are pointing into the future. Next song, next item in the list, last song, last item in the list, and vice versa. Why does right tend to be associated with things in the future and left with things in the past? Uh, I am trying to screen share. Uh, thank you. Uh, you can't see my screen. I think I actually forgot to screen share. Thank you for pointing that out. How's that? Can you all see my screen now? 
Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Okay, all right, let's try this again. So two arrows pointed to the right uh, are obviously uh, associated with things that are in the future, next song, uh, last song, and so on. Two arrows pointed to the left, uh, first, first song, previous song, and so on. Why are rightward pointing uh, triangles associated with future and left associated with past? Uh, I think uh, Bryce mentioned it uh, up here, and so did uh, and so did Willem. Yeah, exactly, right? So in English, we read from left to right. So obviously, words that are to the right of where you're looking at the moment are about to be in your future, assuming you continue reading. And words that are in the left part of your visual field that you have just finished reading are now in your past. Who uh, might interpret these arrows differently? Think about a young person who hasn't used technology before or is starting to, to figure out technology um, and comes across these four icons for the first time. Assuming they are an English speaker or their native tongue is one of the Romance languages, they might be able, able to interpret that right is next and left is previous. Who might be confused? He, who might click on one of these assuming that right means into the past? and left means into the future. Exactly, so if there are any uh, Hebrew speakers or readers uh, on this call here, uh, tends to read right to left. So those speakers, again, assuming they're new to the internet or new to the technology, might have an expectation or make a prediction about what's going to happen when they click on a rightward pointing triangle, which is that they're going to go to a previous page or a previous song, and they get the opposite result. Obviously, that situation may be rare these days because English and, and assumptions that flow from English and the Romance languages tend to dominate the internet and technology in general. But this is just one example of things we need to be careful of when people come in contact with a leap motion device, uh, any new technology, for example, a leap motion device. Most people will wave their right hand over the leap motion device when, they, when they're presented with it because most people are right-handed, but a minority of people will wave their left hand over the device first. Luckily, Leap Motion uh, doesn't care too much uh, about that. You need to ensure that your ASL educational software is also agnostic to which hand uh, is brought over the device. Okay, so again, these cultural differences, psychological differences, they ultimately boil down to prediction and expectation. What do people think the technology is going to do next when they do something to it? Remember our discussion last week uh, about John Dewey, the reflex arc of psychology from the late 19th century? John Dewey said, action comes first. Somebody grabs the leap motion device or tries to do something to it and they're observing how the device pushes back. What happens? Okay, um, other differences that are more specific to just uh, technology usage, obviously. Uh, uh, some people are more comfortable using the mouse. Um, others are more comfortable learning uh, keyboard shortcuts. It depends on your experience level. Um, there are also discretionary users. So users that have to use a technology because it is being forced uh, upon them or they have chosen of their own free will to use that technology. We'll find that people tend to use technology differently based on whether they want to use it or whether they have to use it. Okay, we're trying to think carefully about these unspoken differences among your target demographic, who you're creating the technology for. Okay, let's have a look at activities. Obviously, that's an extremely broad definition. What features of a particular activity do we need to think about? The first one, the, the most primary one, is a purpose. Someone is trying to get from point A to point B, figuratively speaking. They're trying to get something done. Um, the way that they go about doing it, in turn, can be broken down into a lot of much more specific features. The first set of four that we're going to look at here are temporal aspects. How do these activities that people are carrying out, <coughs> how do they unfold uh, over time? 
One thing we might think about is among a group of people that are carrying out these activities, possibly independently or together, how regularly or infrequent is the activity undertaken? Is this something that they're doing continuously throughout the day or are there are certain periods of time in which they're performing this task? If you look at usage history for one person or a large number of people, do you see more or less smooth activity throughout a 24-hour period or are there peaks and troughs of activity? Can you think of technologies um, that have uh, very high peaks or very low troughs? What are some technologies in which at certain times uh, of the day or the, of the week or of the month of the year, when that spike in that technology happens, a whole bunch of people end up using that technology uh, at the same time? Uh, MS Teams, absolutely. So at least here uh, at UVM, at the beginning of lecture periods, uh, you see a spike in usage of MS Teams. Yeah. Other examples? Think about uh, Wi-Fi usage uh, on campus. I don't know what TicketFly is. Sarah, if you want to give us a one or two some, uh, sentence summary and chat here about TicketFly and why there are peaks and troughs, that would be great. Think about Wi-Fi usage on campus in the before times when we were all on campus. When are there peaks in Wi-Fi uh, usage? UVM course registration, absolutely, that's a good example. Uh, okay, buying tickets for for a concert or an event. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, online shopping during Black Friday. Yes. Okay, let's let's test our uh, abilities as HCI designers to to be able to identify subtle aspects of context. The biggest peaks that tend to be seen in a technology is the usage of electricity. And there is a very large peak in electricity usage in the UK at a particular time of day every day. So much so that sometimes it overflows uh, U the UK uh, energy grid and France needs to dedicate electricity to the UK at that time uh, of day. What is this, what is causing this uh, spike in electricity usage in the UK? at a particular time every day, same time every day, once a day. Tea time, getting closer. Boiling water for tea, absolutely. So in the UK at a certain time every day, there is a spike in when everybody seems to want to boil water for tea at the same time. What time is it? Or what, what is it that's causing everyone to boil water for tea at the same time? When people get home from work, not everybody gets home at exactly the same time. The peak is so specific that it happens at a particular minute every day. So it can't be people getting home from work. <laughs> possibly, possibly everyone's parents come over at the same time. Now, obviously, this is cheating because we're not all experts on UK culture, but there is clearly something about uh, there's something that happens in the UK, something cultural that causes everyone to turn on their tea at exactly the same time. No. Joseph has it. So there is a uh, there is a British soap opera that has been running for decades and decades. When that soap opera finishes, and every day, there is a peak when everybody goes and makes tea. Okay, again, kind of a fun example, maybe not so relevant for us, but there are lots of these examples of unexpected context that influence how activities uh, are carried out. Another temporal aspect of an activity that we need to think about is response time. So people have different expectations about how long a technology will take to respond after we literally or figuratively push against it. What are some examples of uh, certain technologies where we expect a real-time response and if we don't get it, we're very frustrated? Or other technologies where we're happy not to, where we don't expect a real-time response?
So website loading time, uh, yeah, multiplayer video games. Obviously, if you're playing a real-time uh, computer game, you expect real-time uh, response. If you're at competitive levels, uh, milliseconds matter. Uh, Siri, maybe we expect a real-time response? Not necessarily. Remember that one of the aspects of context that we're trying to take into account is social context. So what are our expectations about a social exchange, like a conversation, that we've built up over years from decades of experiences of having conversations that we apply to Siri when we have a quote-unquote conversation with Siri. We expect low lag in video conferences, yeah. So when I ask you all a question, I don't expect to see responses in chat immediately. I expect it may take you a few seconds uh, or tens of seconds to think about the question, formulate a response and type it into chat. Same thing with Siri. We expect that Siri is listening whatever that means, but we expect a response relatively quickly. Um, in Siri, uh, I think there's a small beep uh, that you hear immediately after speaking, which is sort of the signal that she hears you, right? Um, if you're in a face-to-face -face conversation with a person, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of hints from their facial features about whether they actually heard you and whether they're thinking about your response, right? Okay. Okay, so uh, let's come back to number three for a moment. Um, is the activity something that in, needs to be carried out in entirety? Um, or is it something that someone wants to work on partly, pause, go do something else, come back and continue the activity? Um, if it's an activity that does have a number of interruptions, how do we make it easier, easy for the user to quote unquote find their place Again, we're going to talk about design uh, in a few minutes, but just to um, jump ahead for a moment. If our users are carrying out an activity which can be interrupted, that influences how we go about designing technology. And as just an example of this, uh, this is a, a parable uh, that comes uh, from economics, actually. Um, and it goes as follows. This is the parable of Tempest and Horror. Horror. Once there were two watchmakers, Horror and Tempest, who made very fine watches. The phones in their workshops rang frequently. New customers were, currently, uh, were constantly calling them, so lots of interruptions. However, Horror and Tempest made their watches differently. Hora prospered, was able to deal with interruptions while Tempest became poorer and poorer. Tempest was not able to deal with the interruptions. What was the reason behind this? What was the reason behind the different ways in which Hora and Tempest build, watch, build watches that allowed one to prosper while the other failed? The watches consisted of about a thousand parts uh, each. The watches that Tempest made were designed in such a way that when he put down a partly assembled watch to answer the phone, it immediately fell into pieces and had to be reassembled from the basic elements. Hora, on the other hand, who prospered, designed his watches in such a way so that he could put together sub-assemblies of about 10 components each. Those 10 components could then be uh, combined into 10, uh, 10 of these sub-assemblies could then be put into a larger sub-assembly, and fi finally 10 of these larger sub-assemblies could be put together to create an entire watch. At each of these three stages, each sub-assembly could be put down without falling apart. So I tried to sort of visualize this here. In the top row here, we have Tempest's uh, design methodology, the way that Tempest builds uh, watches, which is to add each atomic element one at a time, but it's only when he gets to the end that it is an integrated whole, and if he's interrupted at any point before that, he puts down the watch, it falls apart. Hora, on the other hand, created these sub-assemblies that were stable, so he could create a small sub-assembly like you see in the bottom left, then he could create a second stable sub-assembly and so on, and then finally put these stable sub-assemblies together into an entire watch. The point of this parable is that there is a design feature that is missing from Tempest's process that exists in Hora's process. What is that design process? What is that aspect of design that is allowing this activity to be interrupted?
Hopefully most of you write code like Hora and not like Tempest. What is an aspect of good code that allows, uh, allows interruptions, uh, it allows rearrangement of parts into new parts and it still works, and so on. So Damien mentions it here, this concept of modularity. So this parable is just, again, one example, a concrete example of how thinking about the activity, and in this case, the fact that the activity is gonna be interrupted, that informs how we go about designing the technology to begin with. Okay, so uh, what are some other aspects of an activity? Uh, we can also think about the social aspects of it. Is the activity going to be carried out by one person? Is it going to be carried out by a large number of people independently? Or is this activity going to be carried out by large numbers of people that have to try and coordinate and cooperate uh, in some way? We talked about GitHub last time and how GitHub was designed to allow large numbers of people to collectively work on a coding project. Is the task, uh, is the activity itself well-defined or vague? Uh, depending on whether the users can articulate what their activity is or how they'd like to carry it out, that's going to, uh, again, inform how we go about designing the system. If the users can't articulate what they want very well, we might uh, invite them into exploratory design. We might create a lot of different kinds of prototypes, let them play around with it, let us know what works and what doesn't work, and extract from those prototypes and that user testing a set of requirements, which is, again, a written document that describes exactly what the technology should and shouldn't do. Or, if the activity is very well defined, we can do some sequential design. We can go from descriptions of the users about what they want, step by step, to a final technology. And we'll talk about exploratory and sequential design uh, later today. Okay, safety, uh, this is obviously very uh, important. This is becoming increasingly important because a lot of computerized technologies are now being deployed out into the world. As we talked about before, uh, up until recently, most computer technologies were uh, passive and they didn't exist in real time with us. So if your laptop or your desktop made a mistake, it wasn't a big deal. But if your autonomous car makes a mistake, it is indeed a very big deal. So uh, most HCI designers or technology designers in general are having to spend much more time thinking about physical uh, safety. And if, uh, if the technology or the activity is safety critical, obviously we need to think carefully about the technology, provide lots of feedback to the user think carefully about timing uh, and so on. And again, I'm just going to skip ahead uh, to an example of this aspect uh, of safety. Um, back in the 1980s, uh, the Therac 25 was deployed and unfortunately became, the code in the Therac 25 uh, became the worst computer error in history and ended up killing five people and grievously injuring uh, many more. You can go and read, read about this by Googling. Uh, the Therac 25. As the name implies, this was a therapeutic uh, device uh, for those uh, that were suffering from cancer. Um, these patients have a particular cancerous tumor in a particular place in the body that would be hard to operate on or reach uh, with ingested drugs. So the Therac uh, 25 was designed in order to irradiate uh, one part of the patient's body. Uh, with a cloud uh, of, of electrons and, and x-rays, and it worked as follows. There's an electron gun that is moved by software along a rail. Um, out, uh, the patient is lying on a table. The electron gun is moving around the periphery of the, the patient. Closer in towards the patient are a number of uh, basically bricks of lead. And the idea is that the gun is positioned in such a way that it emits a beam of electrons um, that hit the lead shield and cause a diffuse cloud uh, of radiation on the far side, but that cloud reaches uh, the patient's body and irradiates just that point of the body at just the right intensity um, for the particular tumor. Here's a specification of the software for the Therac 25. Uh, obviously, we want to send the commands to move the shields first. Then the sh shields move, then we send the command to fire the gun, and then the gun fires. Obviously, we don't want to fire the gun before we've sent commands to move the shields into position, or the beam might directly hit the patient. 
Turns out that unfortunately, in the Therac 25, that is exactly what happened. These were the specifications, but in reality, this is what happened. So the code sent commands to the shields first. However, the shields moved slower than was expected. So there was a, an un, there was an assumption in the code or in the in the technology in general that if the command to send the shields was sent first and then the command to fire the gun, it would follow that the shields move first and then the gun fires. That was true in the predecessor technology to the Therac 25, which was the Therac 20, which actually did when the Therac 20 was updated to the 25, there were some changes to the physical infrastructure, the rails and the motors that moved the, the shields and the guns, so that now the shields actually moved slower relative to the gun in the Therac 25 than they did in the Therac uh, 20. And that caused what's known as a race condition. There was an unfolding of events over time that was un unexpected. So uh, as you can see here with time running on the horizontal axis here, command was sent to move the shields and then command to fire the gun and the gun fired before the shields were moved into position and unfortunately for many, many patients, they were directly hit by this uh, electron beam which supplied much too much radiation uh, to, to the patient and caused five deaths and many more injuries. So just an example, we need to think very, very carefully about all the physical uh, contexts of the technology, social, cultural, uh, and so on, and only then start to define our specifications. Okay. Related to safety, um, assuming that our system is not perfect, that mistakes are possible, how do we deal with those mistakes, errors, or omissions? Okay, um, there's also, of course, data that is associated with an activity, data that is generated as part of the activity or, gener or data that is consumed by the user during the activity. What is the nature of that data? First of all, how much data are we talking about? And are we talking about, quote unquote, uh, streamy or chunky data? Remember that uh, we're thinking carefully about the sensory systems of human beings. We are primarily visual creatures, so most of the data that we consume when we're working with technology is looking uh, at, a at, a, at, a, at, a, at a screen. What are we presenting on that screen? We might choose video or images. Uh, video is streaming, um, which has advantages and disadvantages compared to images. When you create your uh, educational software, you're gonna be presenting more visualizations to the user um, besides just the, the real-time wireframe that you're creating at the moment. So you're gonna to have to make choices about whether to show a short video or an animation to the user or a static image. What are the pros and cons of video versus images? Why choose one over the other? So for example, um, if you're trying to learn a new programming language like JavaScript, some people jump on YouTube and look for a video tutorial and prefer to watch a video of somebody coding. Or alternatively, you might want to look at a series of screenshots interspersed with text describing uh, how to code. So there are streamy data options if you want to learn a programming language or chunky data, languages, uh, data options if you want to learn a language. Bryce says uh, video can show varying perspectives and give depth perception. True, so we could try and exploit video to project a 3D, the illusion of three dimensions, which may be important for leap motion. What are some other advantages or disadvantages of video over images? What might cause you to choose one or the other? Again, we're talking about design. You want to present some information to the user. How are you going to do this, video or images? Why one or the other?
So one of the obvious uh, advantages of video, as Siddhanth mentions, is that you can convey much more information through video than you can with a static image. So uh, there's the old English saying that uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, and a video sometimes is literally a thousand pictures. So there's an obvious advantage in terms of the amount of data that can be projected through video compared to an image, but not everything these days is video. There are still reasons to keep uh, to, to use an image. What's the disadvantage of video compared to a static image? It's time-consuming, all right, so it takes a while to watch a video. Slower load, yeah, exactly. We might have to wait a while. It's a larger file, absolutely, and some of it, depending on where we are, or who the person is, or what activity they're trying to learn or do, time may be of the essence. Think about, uh, again, now let's go back to human physiology. Think about the visual system. You, you have a human who is watching an image, is watching an image, looking at an image versus watching a video. Uh, in the example of learning the programming language, you might have to keep pausing to keep up. Right? So obviously video can present a lot of information, but that doesn't mean that the user is going to be able to absorb all that information. So relatively quickly, when YouTube became, uh, when YouTube became increasingly popular, one of the early features they put in was to speed up and slow down video. As the name implies itself, streamy obviously means that some of the information is now no longer video is no longer uh, is no longer um, viewable. It's in the past, right? So if you pause a video, obviously you're seeing a very small snapshot of an entire uh, video. For at least a single image, all the information is there. Especially if you're trying to learn something, often it's useful to have a static image and allow time to be able to visually parse or understand what information is being displayed in that information. Same thing goes for text. Text, like uh, a figure, is chunky. Uh, often it helps to read a sentence or a paragraph several times. Speech is also streaming. So again, just the auditory sense is the same thing. You can listen to an audiobook at two times speed, and you can take in the raw data of that audiobook much faster than most people can, can read a book, in theory, but how much of the information in that raw data can you absorb if you listen to an audiobook at two times speed versus reading, uh, reading a piece of text. There are some interesting technologies out there that try and combine the best of both uh, worlds. For example, there is an app, and I'm forgetting the name of it now, that will take a page of text and it will present one word at a time in the center of the screen. So you continue to look at the center of the screen and it will flash up one word after another. And a lot of people report that they can read and retain the information in that text if it is presented in that way rather than uh, the text remaining static and the eyes moving, saccading from one word to the next. Why do you think presenting one word after another very quickly in the center of the, of the screen, so basically streamifying written text, why does streamifying written text allow some people, not everybody, to be able to absorb uh, information in text faster? You can try this after class. It's quite a, quite a fun thing to try. It's closer to how we perceive spoken words. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. So maybe we're trying to reduce the visual load by presenting one word after the other in the center of the screen. It's not so immediately obvious why it's so, why it's so helpful. Okay, I'll leave it for you to, to try out and see if you can, you can think on why that might my, why, my, why that might help. Okay, uh, also we can then start to think about visual design, which we will start to talk about uh, either later today or uh, on Tuesday. 
Again, if we have a large amount of information, we can choose text, 2D visual, 3D visual, motion, sound. We can combine streamy and chunky information. Visual design is a very big part of, of HCI. Okay. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about people. We've talked a little bit about activities. Let's talk about contexts. Uh, again, we've moved from more obvious things into less obvious aspects of design, things we need to think about. Context is usually the trickiest one. And in turn, when we unpack context in the, into different features or different kinds of contexts, some kinds of context are more obvious than others. Physical context is usually the first thing recognized by an HCI designer. Takes much longer to extract the unspoken and unwritten aspects uh, of the activity that are going to influence that activity. So physical physical context, um, where is the technology? Where is the person? Is this a, an activity that's going to be carried out indoors and outdoors? Uh, is there going to be background noise levels? Um, is someone going to be using this technology in a crowded uh, in a crowded space, in which case privacy maybe matters? Um, are they going to be carrying out this activity in the, in the country or in an urban setting, which obviously might impact Wi-Fi, which usually impacts other aspects of the technology? What are some other aspects of physical, what are some other kinds of physical context that might influence your thinking about technological design? Not mentioned here. Think about some of the examples from last time. You're designing control software for a drone. What are some of the physical, what aspects of physical context might matter uh, in the realm of drone technology? You're writing code for autonomous cars. What are some aspects of physical context that matter for autonomous driving? What are some aspects of physical context not mentioned here that may influence the leap motion device? So if we start to think about an activity that's going to be carried out outside, that, un, that should suggest another whole set of physical aspects, of, uh, kinds of physical context that might matter, like weather, like background noise levels. What other physical uh, components, what other physical uh, aspects of physical context in outside settings might matter for drones, autonomous driving, uh, looking at Microsoft Teams on your phone while walking around outside. Lighting obviously matters. Wind, good example, right? Does wind affect the leap motion device? If you were to try this, if you were to sit, sit out on your balcony on a windy day and use the leap motion device, is that going to matter? Is that relevant to the particular activity of using a leap motion device? Uh, speaking of the leap motion device, uh, David Matthews reminded me I misspoke last time uh, about the leap motion device itself. So inside the leap motion device, remember that there are two cameras uh, and it is not the time of flight of the infrared light that leaves the two cameras or the two light sources, hits the hand and comes back. It's actually the parallax in the two uh, images. So what leap motion device is to take uh, those raw images from the two cameras, superimpose them and look for differences between them. And that's how Leap Motion Device goes from raw pixel data to 3D coordinates in the hand. Just a minor detail, but I just wanted to clarify that. Okay, so wind maybe doesn't affect your usage of the Leap Motion Device. Are you sure? It doesn't affect the cameras so much. Okay, we'll leave this as homework. Wait for a, a windy day and sit out on your balcony and see, and see if it affects it. It absolutely will because it might make your hand shake. <laughs> 
exactly, right? So not so obvious. If the wind is coming horizontally, maybe it doesn't matter if you're keeping your hand vertical, uh, horizontally oriented over the device, but if you hold your hand up, you have more cross section and horizontal wind may impact your ability to hold your hand steady over the device. So now we're talking about the orientation of the hand over the device, and we're talking about that because we've uncovered a potential physical context that may influence that activity. Maybe not so obvious, um, maybe not such an obvious thing. And again, maybe an edge case, maybe that's gonna be relatively rare, but these are the kinds of thought processes we wanna get in the habit uh, of undertaking as HCI designers. Okay, social context. How many people are using the technology? What is the distribution across all the people that are using that technology of things like expertise, uh, visual acuity, auditory acuity, fine motor control? Um, this usually affects things like sound, right? So uh, most, most modern software allows you to put in the microphones and hear whatever the auditory uh, output is from there. Um, is this, again, this comes from the before times when we had things like open plan offices. Uh, where is this technology going to be used? Are there other people close by? Can they hear what's going on? Can they see uh, your screen when we all used to fly on airplanes? Um, there was concern about somebody working on some sensitive information on a laptop and somebody sitting in the seat next to them on the plane could actually see their screen. So there are screen darkeners that allow someone who is viewing the screen from even just a few uh, degrees offset to not be able to see what's on the screen. Okay. Organizational context. So again, if we're deploying technology for UVM or for some other large organization, what are some of the unspoken, uh, what are some of the unspoken uh, rules that are at play there that are going to affect how we think about designing that technology? Um, if we think very large scale, uh, obviously, as we know, technology, computer technology is extremely disruptive. Uh, it can create and destroy jobs in different, uh, different sectors and so on. So we can go all the way from what are the unspoken rules in a Microsoft Teams lecture up to what's going to be the impact on an economy when we re release yet another social network technology or autonomous cars start to become more widely uh, adopted. Okay, so now that we've tried to think about all the different ways that people and activities and contexts can uh, be different, can, can uh, diverge, now we can start to think about the technology. But we're only doing that now that we have a pretty good idea of who's using it, how they want to use it, and where, when, and how, or what's, what's surrounding them, what is the context uh, that exists. Okay. In HCI, we're going to spend most of our time thinking about input and output. We're going to be focusing on the inter interface rather than the internal the internals of our software. So what kind of data is coming in? How much? How often? What are the sensors that our technology has available to draw information in from the world? And what output devices does the technology have? Does the technology, is the can the technology actually exploit movement, for example, to broaden the amount of information arriving at an input uh, device? This is not so, uh, not so relevant to traditional technologies like desktops and laptops, but when we start to talk about embedded technologies and robotics and drones and autonomous cars, all those technologies are to some degree capable of motion and they can exploit motion to extract or broaden the amount of information they can draw from the physical world. I gave you a simple example of how humans do that uh, last week. So if we were in a physical classroom and I was looking out at all of you, um, some of the faces of the students sitting in the back row would be occluded by students that are sitting closer. If I want to make eye contact with a student sitting in the back row, all I need to do is move myself. So through self-motion, I can broaden the amount of information that I can, uh, that I can collect. Okay, uh, so and then what is the output uh, of, the, of the technology? What output devices do we have available to us and how should we output information to our user based on what, who they are and what they're trying 
uh, to do. As we just mentioned, um, we might choose chunky data if persistence matters. If the user is going to want to spend some time looking at something or reading something multiple times, we might try and hold the information steady on the screen while they do so. Or perhaps we want to use something that is moving, like uh, a video or uh, an auditory or a soundtrack. And as we'll talk about later when we get to cognitive psychology, people are immediately attracted to things that move or emit a sound. So hopefully most of you are having a hard time not paying attention to the movement of my hand and the sound uh, of my snapping, and you're having a harder time paying attention to my voice than you are now. It is something that is very hard for us to uh, motion and sound over time tends to attract us more than something that is sitting still on the screen. Okay, the technology then may be communicating obviously not just one-on-one -on -one with an individual user, but it may be connecting with other technologies and those are in turn connecting with other people. What is the communication requirements for this technology given who's using it, what they want to do and under what conditions? Okay, and then finally, as I mentioned, uh, once we've decided on these things, we might start to think about the internals of the software, but how to make decisions, design decisions about the internals of a software system is not going to be covered in this class. That's the focus of software engineering. Okay, one aspect though of internals that might matter, which is the last line on this slide, is how visible should we make the internal mechanism of code, how visible should we make it to the user? Does the user need to know what's going on inside the technology? Most of the time, the answer is no. We want to try and hide as much of the internal details of what's going on as possible. But there are exceptions. When do we want to advertise to a user or users what's going on inside software? So open source code, yeah, absolutely. So maybe we're dealing with users who are technologically savvy and they want to see literally what's going on under the hood. Pilots flying planes, so obviously planes should not always be reticent. Sometimes they need to provide information about what's going on inside. Security features. What is it about security features, Joseph, that uh, should be advertised to a user? On the surface, we usually think of secure systems as those that are not advertising what's going on inside. But you're right, there are cases where we might want a secure system to advertise what's going on inside. We might want to advertise, as Nolan says, we might want to advertise the fact that security is happening at all. That's pretty important. If I'm interacting with an app or a piece of software, I want to know how secure it is. And I might want the software to try and prove it to me. There may be reasons I want to make the internal mechanism visible to the user. Okay, uh, I thought this was just a, a fun example. This is a kind of an older example now. Um, before BitTorrent, um, someone would get uh, the latest movie, would rip the latest uh, movie illegally from somewhere, and then everyone else would try and upload that illegal, uh, that illegally obtained movie from the original uh, donor. But if you think about the physical, social, and cultural context of trying to share illicit content and share a very large piece of data, like, uh, like a two-hour movie, there, that influenced the design of BitTorrent, which came up with the innovation that obviously we're going to have a bottleneck if everybody tries to download the latest Avengers movie from one person. So better instead to take that very large data set, cut it up into different pieces, which is represented by the different colored uh, dots here. And the initial provider, the initial server, who is uh, connected to n minus one clients, sends different parts of this large data set to different clients. And then those clients in turn become servers. They become the point this person, this particular client becomes where you get the red part of the video. This client becomes the place where you get the green part of the video uh, and so on. Joseph says, didn't Apple advertise for years that Mac doesn't get viruses? Absolutely, uh, they did. They can't really rely on that aspect of their, uh, their systems anymore.
Okay, so obviously this design decision to cut up uh, a large piece of data and distribute it in many ways was a design decision in response to a technological constraint, which is you have a very large piece of data and only one person has it at the beginning, so you, you want to try and avoid a bottleneck. But there are cultural aspects of this particular activity, sharing an illegal movie, that also influenced this innovation of blending server and client. What is the, cult what is the cultural context here that influenced the, these design decisions in the BitTorrent technology? Think about it from the point of view of the people that are trying to obtain and share uh, illicitly obtained movies. Why is it advantageous to blur the distinction between server and client? less liability why less liability obviously the people involved in this activity would like to avoid uh, police observation or police interest harder to identify who's doing what so from a legal point of view everything everyone is doing something bad here they're all involved in uh, sharing a piece of technology Again, these days, maybe this is not so relevant. A lot of information is out there, but it might be harder to identify who is doing what. And in particular, it may be difficult to identify who the original server was. You can imagine that most, uh, that most um, the police interest here is not necessarily in everyone who's sharing the latest movie, but who is consistently the one that has the information first. They might want to try and trace this illicit activity back to a leak in a particular movie studio. Where is, where is this illicit content coming from? And BitTorrent partially was designed to try and obfuscate or cover up, make it harder for, uh, uh, for the law to work upstream to find out who caused this to begin with. Okay, it's kind of a fun example, I think. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is uh, we're going to take a, a few minutes and you're going to, I guess we can't really do this in pair, so you'll do this on your own. Um, I want you to think about creating a technology or sketching out in one or two sentences a technology in response to a particular uh, set of people carrying out an activity in a context. Um, I think probably the best way to do this is open up your favorite text editor, think about these P, A's, and C's, and write out two or three sentences of a T, a technology that you've, you're designing to address the people, activities, and context here. And then uh, at the end of a few minutes, I'll ask you to copy and paste your couple of sentences into chat. I think that's probably the easiest way to do this. So, uh, a store in a mall, again, this is an example from the before times when people went to malls. A store in a mall wants to scan the shopping bags carried by consumers that are walking by uh, outside the store in the mall and change the content advertised in their storefront accordingly. You may or may not agree with uh, the store wanting to do this, but let's assume you work for a software company that has been uh, that has been charged with creating software to do this. What are the aspects of technology you need to keep in mind? And what are the unspoken aspects? What are the unspoken features of context that are going to matter here and should influence your design of this technology? Uh, here's a second example. You can work on number one or two or both. Uh, imagine we want to de uh, deploy a set of wireless sensors. They're going to be deployed into a rainforest to measure environmental variables over a two-year period. We're going to basically deploy them and assuming, uh, hopefully they're designed in such a way that they can uh, remain operational for two years. We're then going to come back and collect the sensors and any data that they weren't able to communicate um, to uh, to satellites or some other place. Okay, so uh, let's see, it is 9.30 exactly, so I'll give you uh, three minutes, let's say until 9.33,
to type out a few sentences about technologies and what aspect, what, what unspoken aspects of context is your technology responding to. Okay, I think we're uh, a little behind where I wanted to be today, so let's uh, let's carry on. Um, if you manage to type something out, um, just go ahead and copy and paste it into chat. Let's see what uh, what you all were able to come up with. All right, need to be durable, resistant to heat and humidity for the sensors. Yep, lots of ideas here. It's going to be hard to parse this out. Uh, Robert mentioned uh, in the case of the mall technology, this would be an intrusive technology on the public uh, as these bags are unwillingly being searched through. Um, exactly. So are the people carrying the, the bags, are they stakeholders or uh, users? Are they, uh, did they agree to this? Cole says each bag can contain a barcode, QR code that identifies the store that the bag came from, right? So shopping bag. So maybe uh, we're going to add some uh, QR codes uh, to the bags. This code could then be read by a device and displays, displays corresponding advertising, right? So we could construct some complex computer vision and try and recognize logos on a bag, for example, and project advertising appropriately. Or we could simplify the recognition part of this technology using a barcode or a QR code. Okay, so uh, let's imagine, I'm, I'm now going to change these technologies slightly on you, or sorry, I'm gonna change P or A or C. 
And as you've already identified in the case of number one, clearly there are privacy uh, concerns here. Maybe not everybody agrees to do this. Uh, what happens if something was bought in a store by a miner and that miner is walking by another store and that store projects some advertising uh, based on that. So maybe we want to try and restrict uh, who we're going to project this information to. Maybe it's not just miners, but maybe somebody buys something in a store and when they're buying something in the store, they indicate they would prefer not to be a participant in this cloud of technologies that's now being deployed in the mall. How does that change your thinking about the technology? How would we protect either people to whom we should not be projecting targeted advertising or consumers who have opted out of targeted advertising in this mall setting? Alternatively, let's make a change to physical context here. We're gonna try and deploy these wireless sensors in a rainforest canopy. So I'm being a little bit more specific about where the sensors are being deployed. Take maybe two minutes to think about how these slight changes to P and A and C change your thinking about the technology. Again, maybe you wanna write uh, something very short in your text editor. Only describe the change you're making to your thinking, your, the changes you're making to your technology based on these changes. It's 9.35, uh, take until 9.37, and then you can go ahead and copy and paste your changed technology into chat. Okay, if you've uh, typed out something about a change to your technology based on these changes, go ahead and uh, drop it into chat. Uh, there was a mention uh, for the canopy. Someone might have to actually carry, uh, carry the technology or the sensors up into the, the canopy. Yeah. Uh, Prasida mentions maybe we would add some machine learning to number one to identify the user's age. Okay, again, difficult, difficult to do. Uh, Joseph says uh, we should have a unique identifier on each shopping bag. Uh, this would be uh, the best privacy conscious way to uniquely identify each shopper and see if they've opted out. It would also allow to filter out children regardless of physical appearance, right? So I think uh, obviously one of the easiest things to do is that at the point of sale, so when someone actually buys a purchase, uh, the, um, uh, the shop clerk asks what kind of bag they want. Do they want to opt in and out? and they might get a bag with a QR code if they opt in, and they get a bag without a QR code if they, uh, if they opt out. Okay. 
So we're exploiting some aspect of a mall, which is people buy things and usually put them in a bag that's issued by the store itself. And that might allow us to simplify the technology and attack this issue of privacy or a default opt out in a simpler way. Um, so we're rather than having to fall back on something more complex like facial recognition software, which is clearly not going to be perfect. It's a much more complex and error prone uh, choice. However, of course, that may not be an option in outdoor settings or more unstructured environments. Okay, um, I noticed that Teams keeps a record of all of your ideas uh, in uh, the team channel itself, so that's, that's great. Okay, so, all right, so that concludes our discussion on uh, packed analysis. We've got uh, five minutes left, so we'll just start in on our discussion of design uh, today. So. Given the fact that we think carefully and we might need to do some, we might actually need to visit the mall and sit and watch what happens. We might need to interview uh, shop clerks, owners of stores, people visiting the mall to try and understand exactly what P, A, and C do. Once we start to collect all that information back, how? How do we go about designing the technology? So we're going to talk uh, in the next few lectures about design philosophy and process. Okay, so uh, we're going to start by recognizing that design is a transformation. We are transforming one thing into another. What are we, what are we transforming? We're transforming some need uh, on the part of our, our demographic. So something that they can already do, but they can't do it very well, or it's supported per poorly by an existing technology, or it's sort of an unspoken need or desire that doesn't exist yet. So our uh, shop owners in the mall would like to project uh, targeted advertising to each person that walks by. We're assuming in the hypothetical example that that doesn't exist yet. So there's a need that's not supported by technology yet. We're gonna take that need or that desired activity and translate it into a physical structure and or process. So a physical device and some software um, in the best way possible. If we have a need, and there's obviously lots of different technologies we could dream up to try and meet that need, even for just one piece of technology, one candidate technology, there are different ways that we could get from A, the activity, to T, the technology. Which of those different types of design or different design processes is the best one? So we're distinguishing now between design process. How do we take P, A, and C and gradually turn it into a T? That's a design process. There may be multiple design processes for a given set of activities and a set of candidate technologies, different people may have different ideas about which of those different transformations, those different design processes, is the best one. That's a design philosophy. Okay. So instead of reinventing the wheel, we're going to look at different design philosophies and processes from different domains outside of HCI and outside of computer science. And we're gonna look at those domains in a certain order. We're gonna start with domains that are very subjective, like fine art. How does someone sit down and create a work of art? That is still a, a translation of a need, which is to express an emotion or an idea into a physical structure, a painting, uh, a song. However, it is subjective. What are some of the design philosophies around fine art, creating uh, a work of art? And we will march from very subjective disciplines like the arts through disciplines that, like HCI, are a mixture of subjective and objective. Architecture is a great example of that. There are objective aspects of architecture. We want to build a house that doesn't fall down, and that house should not be infinite in cost. There are real-world objective constraints on what we can build. But there are also subjective considerations as well. Most of us would prefer not to live in a plain box. So how does, how does an architect, uh, what, what is the design philosophy in architecture that reconciles or combines subjective and objective considerations while designing something based on a need, such as housing or shelter, uh, 
and so on. Uh, language itself, uh, writing an English a good English sentence is also usually a combination of subjective and objective considerations. There is something, there is a need, you want to uh, express an idea, what is the best way to try and create a sentence that captures that, uh, that idea. We'll then continue on into increasingly more objective domains like uh, engineering, so designing a physical device, software engineering, like creating a good piece of software, and ending with interface design. So back to HCI, where we're trying to reconcile or combine objective and subjective considerations during the design of that uh, interface. Okay, I think with that overview, this is probably a good place uh, to pause for today. Um, just before we break, a reminder that you have a quiz uh, due tonight. You are continuing to work on Deliverable 2. My office hours today will be at 3 o'clock rather than at 11 a.m. Um, good luck, have a good rest of your week, and we will see you back here for lecture on Tuesday morning. Bye-bye, everybody.